Welcome to science class. Today we are going to learn how the atmosphere is heated, how that heat is transferred, and why temperatures in different regions vary. There are three major components to this. One is the structure of the atmosphere itself. Certain molecules are better at absorbing heat than others. These are the greenhouse gases, such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane. Then there is the sun, which ultimately is the source of all of the heat energy in the atmosphere. But the oceans are powerful influences as well. Like the atmosphere, the oceans absorb heat, but the oceans can absorb vastly greater amounts of heat, which can then be re-released or radiated back into the atmosphere. And as we have learned, the oceans circulate, so they transfer this heat to places which otherwise would be much colder. Our goal today is to take a look at all of these factors. Let's get started. As I stated, the sun is the source for all of the heat energy that our planet receives. That heat energy is not evenly spread out because Earth is a sphere. Take a specific amount of heat energy from the sun that strikes the Earth. In the tropics, that heat energy is concentrated in a specific area, but the same amount of heat energy becomes spread over a much greater area in the temperate regions. The laws of physics state that systems tend to maximize their entropy, so this heat does not ultimately stay in the tropics. It migrates to less concentrated areas, or it attempts to. This is what causes temperature differences, wind, ocean currents, weather fronts, and much more. But those are not exactly the subject of this video. Let's actually back up and define heat. Heat is the energy transfer from one object to another because of differences in their temperature. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of the individual atoms and molecules of a substance. Okay, so what does any of that mean? As you may have heard, even solid objects at rest buzz or vibrate at the atomic level. The atoms cannot freely move around, like they can in a liquid, but they still have a tiny bit of motion or kinetic energy. As a block of ice absorbs more heat energy, that heat transfers to the water molecules, giving them more kinetic energy. Eventually, those water molecules can absorb enough heat energy to allow them to freely flow in a liquid state. The temperature of liquid water is greater than ice because the molecules of water are moving faster, which is to say they have more heat energy. The reason a heater feels hot is because the faster moving air molecules coming from the heater strike your body and transfer kinetic heat energy to you. Your molecules on your body literally vibrate faster. That's why you feel warmer. A metal surface feels cold because it is a good conductor. It steals heat energy away from you and absorbs it into itself. If you have something metal or glass in your room, touch it. It feels cold. Now compare that to a wood or plastic surface in your room. That will feel normal. But I promise that the metal, glass, wood, or plastic objects are all the exact same temperature. They're in the same room. They are room temperature. They just allow the transfer of heat energy to occur in different ways. And you are not room temperature. You are warm blooded, so you have heat to lose. Okay, I know that was a tangent, but it's important to understand what heat is before moving on. The kind of heat transfer that I just described is what's known as conduction. Picture a pool table and a set of pool balls. The cue ball is struck and when it hits the others, they scatter. The cue ball transferred its energy to the others. This is what conduction is, except it's on the scale of atoms and molecules. Again, an object heats up because energy is added to it in the form of heat. The way a heater heats up a room is the fast moving air from the heater collides with slower moving air molecules, giving them more kinetic energy and making the overall temperature of the room go up. The average speed of all the molecules of air in the room is greater after the heater has been turned on, so the temperature goes up. Take a look at this simulation. There are air molecules at a certain temperature in the room. I'm going to add several more molecules at a much greater temperature. Let's pay attention to the interaction between the molecules first. Notice how the colder molecules speed up when they collide with the hotter molecules, and how the hotter molecules slow down a bit after colliding. This is conduction. This is heat transfer. Now watch again, but this time look at the temperature. Notice how the temperature always remains constant, 
This is because temperature is an average of all the kinetic energies of the objects. When I first introduce the hotter molecules, they have more energy and are moving faster, but that is offset by the slower moving molecules. After enough collisions have taken place, all of the molecules are moving at about the same speed. When it comes to air, the molecules are spaced out so widely that collisions occur pretty rarely. For this reason, conduction alone plays no significant role in the heating of the atmosphere. Convection is the most influential mechanism for heating in the lower atmosphere. The ground and the oceans absorb heat energy from the sun, which they then radiate upwards into the atmosphere. You have seen this before if you've ever noticed the shimmering air above a parking lot or a street on a hot day. This heat makes the air above the radiating surface less dense, so it rises up. That's what convection is. It's the transfer of heat by the circulation of a substance. Now to be clear, convection basically forces conduction to occur at a much faster rate. So conduction is still the process that causes the heat energy to transfer, but without convection, the transfer of energy would occur at a much slower rate and would only affect a tiny part of the atmosphere rather than the global network of heat transport that we have instead. So far, what we have described is how the heat that is absorbed by the atmosphere and the oceans and land mixes with the atmosphere to add heat energy to it. But I also said that the sun is the source of heat. So how does the sun heat the earth? The heat from the sun comes from energy in the form of radiation. Radiation is the transfer of energy in the form of waves or particles. But in the case of the sun, we specifically mean infrared radiation. The sun creates a huge range of what we call electromagnetic waves. The sun releases radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, UV, X-rays, and gamma rays. But the type of electromagnetic waves that heat the lower atmosphere are the infrared waves. As that infrared heat from the sun reaches the atmosphere, a number of different things occur. There are three different possibilities when energy strikes an object. Some of the energy may be absorbed. This is what causes an object to become heated by an external source of heat, for example. The object may also transmit the energy but not absorb it, such as how glass allows light to pass through but the glass is not affected by the light. Or the object may reflect the energy, such as how a mirror reflects light and does not allow any light to pass through. Similar to reflection is scattering, in which a wave is broken into multiple weaker waves that travel in different directions. This is exactly what happens when light is broken into a spectrum by a prism. Scattering happens in the atmosphere. It's why the sky looks blue. It's also why the shade is not 100% dark. Light strikes Earth's surface in all directions. It's just more intense in the direction directly facing the sun. If there was no scattering, then the darkness of the shade of a tree or building would be total, and you would completely disappear under that shade. But it's not just scattering that goes on in the atmosphere. The atmosphere absorbs, reflects, transmits, and scatters heat energy from the sun. Around 25% of the heat from the sun is reflected by the atmosphere, most of which is done by clouds. Around 20% of the heat is absorbed directly by the atmosphere. Around 50% of the heat transfers all the way to Earth's surface and is absorbed. And the final 5% of the sun's heat is reflected off of Earth's surface back into space. Of that 50% of heat that is absorbed by the surface of the Earth, it has to eventually be radiated back out. But because the sun shines every day, Earth doesn't continue cooling off. The radiation of heat from Earth's surface, which is partially trapped and slowed down by the atmosphere, helps to keep Earth's temperatures stable at night, unlike what happens on the moon. But the atmosphere also directly absorbs some of the heat energy from the sun. This is the greenhouse effect. Again, it is exclusively infrared energy from the sun that provides the heat to Earth's lower atmosphere. And it's only a few molecules that are capable of absorbing heat carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor, for example. Ozone is heated by the absorption of UV radiation, but 90% of Earth's ozone is trapped between 20 and 30 kilometers above sea level, nowhere near the surface to influence weather or climate. The final thing we will discuss today is why temperatures vary widely from places that are on the same latitude. Latitude is key because latitude determines how much direct sunlight, and therefore heat energy, you absorb. 
but as we saw in the ocean currents video, being at the same latitude does not mean your local temperatures will be the same, not even close. Water is what we will begin with, or proximity to water that is. Let's compare Vancouver, Canada and Winnipeg, Canada, both at the same latitude. Vancouver is on the Pacific coast, while Winnipeg is landlocked. Living next to large bodies of water greatly decreases the range of temperatures you experience. Just look at how much larger the range of average temperatures throughout the year in Winnipeg is compared to Vancouver. The waters around Vancouver are not warm. The currents coming towards Vancouver come from even farther north. So why are the winter months so much warmer? Water is a much greater conductor than land, and water can absorb huge amounts of energy. Water is so good at absorbing heat that a plastic bag full of water can be held over an open fire and the bag won't melt. Even though the waters are cold, they're not freezing. Water radiates tremendous amounts of heat into the atmosphere, keeping the land near coasts significantly warmer during cold months. Notice again how the temperatures in Vancouver stay just above freezing, which is approximately the temperature of the water at this time, while in Winnipeg, the temperatures drop significantly below freezing. But not all coasts are equal. In the Ocean Currents video, we compared the temperatures of not France to St. John's, Newfoundland. That difference was caused by the warmth of the water. But let's compare two different cities. Here are the average temperatures for Eureka, California, and New York City. The temperature of the waters next to each of these cities is basically the same. So why is the temperature so much more stable in Eureka than in New York? It's because of the wind. In Eureka, the wind almost always blows from the ocean to the land. So it transfers that radiating heat from the oceans to the land. While in New York, the wind typically blows out towards the ocean, pushing away the radiating heat coming off of the waters. Geography can also have dramatic effects over a short distance. I live about 180 kilometers from the coast, but the temperatures here are extremely hot in the summer, and it never rains in the summer either. The Central Valley of California is cut off from the potential temperature regulation and moisture that the ocean provides because of the coastal mountain range. If this mountain range didn't exist, this area of California would naturally be much more green and the summers would be cooler as well. Altitude drastically changes temperatures for the simple reason that thin air cannot hold nearly as much heat energy. In Watertown, South Dakota, where I taught science for five years, the average high in July is 83 degrees Fahrenheit. This is identical to Bryce Canyon in Utah, but the average low in Watertown in July is 60 while it is 47 in Bryce Canyon. This is because Bryce Canyon is two and a half thousand meters above sea level, and Watertown is only 527 meters above sea level. The thinner air cannot retain heat nearly as well throughout the night. The final factor that greatly influences climate is cloud cover. Having a lot of cover keeps the temperatures stable, meaning there is a small difference between highs and lows. At night, clouds insulate the air beneath them by preventing the heat that radiates from the ground from escaping into the upper atmosphere. If you look at a graph of the average temperatures in Seattle, one of the cloudiest cities in the country, you can see that there's very little difference between daytime highs and nighttime lows. Where I live, in the summertime, there's upwards of 30 degrees of difference in average highs and average lows. This is because from May to October, we average about two days of rain, and you will not see a cloud over your head all summer long. So we are bombarded with the sun's heat all day, but then at night, the ground releases that heat, and because there are no clouds, it simply escapes into the upper atmosphere. Odds are, you probably don't have much of an experience with the ocean or the surrounding geology where you live, but you definitely have an experience with the weather all the time, if you go outside, that is. Hopefully, you can take this information and understand what's going on outside. Next time, we are going to discuss humidity. Thanks for watching.